software that we can use for teaching and well mm -hmm. we will hear about that no I, I I hope that this will be something that people will uh, think about adopting. Uh, I had um, given an invited uh, workshop uh, about this uh, in um, Argentina, in University of Buenos Aires, about three years ago. Um, and there were a number of um, instructors, professors from Brazil as well, who attended that. And I know, And I know that at least some of them have gone on and are using it. So I hope this one... Uh, will lead to others using it as well. Yeah, My backdrop, wonderful. as you've seen here, is uh, that was a, actually a photo that I took uh, at the Science Museum in Buenos Aires. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, nice, nice, because actually it's like this: science has no part, no country. Science it has no religion, has no uh, ideology by itself. No. And what we have in pseudoscience, we have the beliefs guiding all the things for you talk about this pseudoscience. And you know that in Brazil, there is a very famous... <laughs> Your internet is funny, yeah. Fabrício. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, he's a chemistry, but he is... Point in the <laughs> intelligent design world and organize the first continue. Mm -hmm. Fabricio, uh, your internet is kind mm -hmm. of breaking a little bit. Anyway. Uh, did you get it, Fabricio? Your internet connection is uh a little bit broken sometimes. Yeah, yeah so I stopped it because of that. <laughs> yeah. That might help a little bit. Yes, yes. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, I could not yeah, yeah, so, the, the question that you had. Uh -huh. Sure. I'm uh, I'm looking at the the popcorn popping here to, to see. Usually people, when it's uh, 2 p.m., they go to the website or to the email check, where's the link to go? So <laughs> they are kind of connecting here. And I also open um, a window in, uh, in YouTube. There are some people here. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wow, YouTube is delayed over than 10 seconds. Wow, see, <laughs> 15 seconds uh, delayed in YouTube. I measure uh, to see how people are, are uh, uh, checking the our meeting there. We have 39. So, uh, Dr. Robert, are you planning to come to Brazil uh, for a, a workshop or so in, on the, the Avida? Uh, I had given uh, this workshop uh, uh, in Argentina. Argentina. Three, three years ago. Three years uh, ago. And, and at that time, there were uh, biology professors really from around the area Colombia, mm -hmm. Brazil, um, and others who attended that. Uh, and I, I actually have a picture. I'll, I'll show you some of those. Uh, we are. Nice group. We, I would love to come back again. It was great. It was great uh, fun. Uh, we, are, we are in the core of the, of the country, but João Paulo over there is connecting from another PhD program on bioinformatics and genetics and evolution. And uh, João Paulo is by the beach over there in Natal, uh, on the northeast of Brazil. Nice place, lots of rains. Hi, João Paulo. Did you know about Avida? Yeah, actually, after the after the the call of the of the conference, I've I've searched some things about the program. Hi, Robert. Hello, nice to hello. meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, I invited Fabrizio, how is your connection? Because you are the, the responsible for the invitation. I would like you to introduce Dr. Roberts and the program. 
let's see let's listen to your internet uh, how how uh, is your connection right now open your micro Sorry, microphone I need a 3g connection let's see it is open are you listening <laughs> Yes, no? it's okay, 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 okay. okay. I Let's get for... started. So you are in the command. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Robert, for coming to talk to us. Fabricio, you lead. Thanks, Miguel, for inviting Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert Pennock is philosopher of science and distinguished professor at Michigan State University of the Department of Philosophy and Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Yeah? And he is going to talk about AVIDA ED, a learning evolution and the, a learning evolution program that we are going to hear uh, with your talk. And he has also a lot of experience in teaching evolution. So I'm also a teacher in evolution, and we have many issues sometimes how to explain students some particular situation. And, and also, we have to deal with this kind of pseudoscience that we are dealing in our grid society that was very much uh, 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 connected to the way of life of people in the past that now we also have to deal with in the science because the pseudoscience is mixing uh, ideas, ideologies, and uh, well, we, we need more teaching, you need better tools, and I think Avida is a very good one. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Yeah. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, shall I uh, go ahead now and uh, share my screen? Let's see if this will if this will work. Uh, let me just confirm with everyone if that's visible. Perfect. All right, now there's supposed to be a, a new feature that I was going to try that would also overlay me, but apparently that's not working at this point. So I'll just go ahead with it in this form. Um, and uh, and I, th I think that should be okay. Uh, so again, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm a, a professor in a number of different departments. Uh, the interest that I have in this topic uh, really is an overlap between my interest in philosophy of science uh, and uh, specifically uh, evolutionary biology is the science that I'm most uh, concerned and interested with. And this is a project uh, that I've been working on really for almost uh, almost two decades. Uh, and the software that I'm going to introduce you to is a, um, it's now in its, its fourth version. Uh, <laughs> we're just uh, in this coming week, uh, ready to re release the full public uh, fourth version of this. Uh, but really for the last 15 years, we've been developing uh, this as an educational version of the research platform of Ida. And what I'm gonna do is give you an overview of sort of the context uh, and the background and the theory behind this, uh, a little bit of a, uh, of a tour of what it looks like and how it works, uh, and then hopefully uh, inspire you to make use of it uh, yourselves. So let me just give a very quick overview of, of what you're all familiar with, uh, evolutionary science, uh, just so that I can focus attention on the key part that I'm going to be interested in. Darwin, uh, of course, um, uh, showed that evolution occurred, the fact of evolution. He called it descent with modification. Um, we we'll sometimes think of this as common descent thesis of all organisms being descended from others in this great tree of life. Obviously, we know much more about uh, that since Darwin. Uh, the molecular processes were, of course, totally unknown to him. Uh, but now we can talk about this at a biomolecular level, and we'll speak about the fact of evolution as being changes in gene frequencies and populations uh, over generations. This is just uh, the fact that it happens, right? the great tree of life. Um, the second related issue to that are, are is research about the structure of that tree of life. What are the pathways of evolution? Uh, which organisms, which populations, which species are related uh, to which others? Some of this work is done, of course, from fossil records, uh, but also uh, now with molecular uh, methods uh, to uh, determine those relationships and, and how things uh, evolved over, over time. Um, 
But the key discovery that Darwin made, of course, uh, was the discovery of the mechanism of evolution. That's his, that's his key discovery, how it is that this process happens uh, to produce descent with modification, but also specifically to produce adaptations. Uh, and I like to talk about this really as a law. I talk about it as Darwin's law. Uh, and um, it involves recognizing that these causal elements, uh, when working together, will produce descent with modification, will produce adaptation. Well, what are those elements? The key basic ones are random variation um, that can be inherited uh, and then subject to natural selection. Um, there's obviously many details about this that Darwin did not know. Um, he was wrong about some of the uh, elements about what underlay these, but he was right at the level that was important. Um, he saw, observed, gave evidence for each of the elements of this and showed how they all work together. The random variation that can be passed on uh, and being subject to natural selection will give rise to changes in the population over time such that they will adapt to their environments. Uh, and uh, under certain circumstances will diverge and split, uh, given rise to new species. Uh, this is of course very familiar to biologists. Uh, as Theodosius Dobzhansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is the fundamental explanatory principle uh, behind uh, all of biology. Um, uh, and uh, in the uh, decades and century and a half since Darwin's discovery, uh, we of course know, again, details about this that go well beyond uh, what he himself knew, but which have confirmed and extended uh, what his discovery was. Uh, it's so fundamental now uh, that one can't as a biologist really conceive of doing one's work without understanding and recognizing this as what um, drives and, and underlies uh, the explanation of everything else that we see in biology. But not everyone accepts it. <laughs> uh, and this is the context, the cultural context uh, that uh, is important to recognize that in uh, many countries, um, uh, the acceptance, the public acceptance of evolution uh, is um, variable. Uh, in some places like, uh, you know, Denmark, Sweden, uh, uh, the, the blue bars indicate broad public acceptance. Uh, but uh, if you go all the way down to the bottom, the United States is, is near the bottom with regard to public acceptance. Uh, uh, more than a third of Americans uh, reject evolution. Uh, so this is a problem that we have here uh, when you're teaching this subject that's different from when you're teaching other subjects in science. Uh, you can have physics and chemistry without having to worry about what the uh, students think in advance or what the blowback might be with regard to that. Here, you can't assume that people will just accept it. Uh, and part of what you need to do as an instructor is come into your teaching knowing that there will be misconceptions, probably more so than in other sciences, uh, and that you need to do things to, to try to help that. There's the United States down at the bottom. Uh, it's gotten a little bit better since this survey was done. Uh, we actually have an updated survey that was done uh, more recently uh, with this. Uh, it's improved slightly, but it's still pretty bad. <laughs> uh, so that's that's uh, discouraging. Um, these are other figures from the United States, again, from a somewhat earlier survey um, that uh, even after having a college education, about a third of them would say no. Uh, to the question of whether the modern theory of evolution has a valid scientific foundation. That's that's a very sorry figure. Uh, uh, the difficulty, of course, is that, that you go through college and not really take a, take a class and know about it. Uh, so that accounts for part of it, but it really should be uh, part of a basic education. Uh, and to have a number this high is, is obviously problematic. Um, Two elements of this, one is just about the theory of evolution itself, but the other is what counts as a scientific foundation? What is it that makes uh, 
um, science accepts something. And that comes into the philosophy of science. And that's why I think when we teach um, these subjects, we want to not only get the results that science has discovered, but also be teaching about the process, the way of thinking, the reasoning that provide evidence, that provide a foundation for those conclusions. Uh, and so what I'm going to be talking about really will try to combine those. We have the same problem here at lower levels. Uh, this was uh, a survey showing that really a very large percentage of high school biology teachers think that there are sufficient problems to cast doubt on its validity. And, and again, this is something where um, the training is inadequate, obviously, um, to not understand sort of how evolution works, but also to not understand what the evidence is that supports it, because it's as well supported, if not more so, to the other sciences uh, that are taught. And really, we should think about how to do it in a way to get that across and to really see this as something that's a law of nature in just the same way and of the same foundational importance as other laws in science. Now, uh, in the United States, there's been efforts to improve science education, specifically life science education. Uh, this was a series of uh, white papers that came out starting in 2011 that was specifically about how to improve and reform uh, education at the undergraduate level. That then led to uh, a similar document for the advanced placement biology for undergraduate uh, framework, I mean, for a high school framework. Uh, and then following that, the next generation science framework uh, was for uh, showing this uh, at, the, at the level for public schools and so on. And for all of these, evolution became uh, explicit and central. And I'll just show some of the things that were brought about this. Um, vision and change had four core, four to five core ideas that life science education should include, and evolution was prominent as one of them. Uh, the other thing that was important about these is that they talked about scientific practices that you should learn as a student, and we should be sure to teach, uh, uh, how it is that science comes to its conclusions. So they would recognize that these conclusions, evolution being one of them, are valid um, uh, conclusions. And so they learn and ought to learn about this process of science as asking questions, developing models to, to test them, figuring out how to test them and to analyze data. Um, so all of these are really methodological issues. And again, from a philosophical point of view, um, I almost think that's more important than some of the specific content. If you can show why it is that we come to these conclusions, uh, that's going to be far more important for understanding science uh, than just perhaps um, learning some of the results. So I think this has been a, a big uh, improvement. And in this intervening now decade, uh, there's been a lot of work in promoting new materials, new ways of doing curriculum to try to emphasize these aspects. Now, evolution has some particular challenges, okay? Uh, at least here, as I mentioned, there are many misconceptions that students have coming in because of the cultural um, uh, circumstance where they've been told things that are often just wrong. Uh, there are also just elements of evolutionary science where the terms have colloquial, ordinary meanings, that are different from the technical meetings. And so it's easy to have a misconception about these things like fitness, for example. Um, so it's a challenge for an instructor. They have to know that students will come in with these misconceptions and you can have to work to overcome them. Uh, another difficulty is that unlike other kinds of sciences where you can do a lab very easily uh, within a lab period, <laughs> Uh, evolution is very slow. Uh, it's hard to observe directly. I mean, this is the sort of thing where if you're doing evolutionary experiments, even a graduate student working in any natural system would only have time, even over a whole PhD program, to observe something in a very short time frame. And it takes a lot of effort to be able to do that. So doing it in a classroom is, is even harder, of course. And instructors have come up with very clever ways to um, try to get across how it works. Uh, but we have to recognize that it's a challenge relative to others. And it'd be nice if we could find a way to do it better. Um, 
part of the recommendations for certain science practices in STEM education is to have uh, what are called inquiry-based labs, where the students are learning the concepts, uh, observing them, testing them as part of the lab itself. Uh, and that's just very difficult for, for evolution just because of its uh, slow and, and uh, uh, the, the size of populations that would be needed in order to sort of see how this works. So it makes it very hard to have those sorts of uh, lab sections. Uh, and then because of this, uh, typically we wind up teaching them from the front of the classroom, from the podium, uh, and just saying you need to accept what I say. And that's opposite of what you want science to be about. You shouldn't accept any conclusion science on someone's authority, on someone's to say so. Uh, and yet evolution seems to be something where they're just told to accept it on faith because it's so hard to have a real uh, lab test and so on. So those are challenges. And uh, our task was to try to find a way to overcome uh, some of those challenges. And that's what Avita Ed uh, was created to do, uh, to take something that was used as a research platform, the Avita Artificial Life Platform, and to put it into a graphical user interface friendly for uh, students who didn't have computer science uh, background and so on, uh, and for instructors to be able to use this so that they would have essentially uh, an artificial life lab bench to teach about evolution uh, in an experimental way and simultaneously teach about the nature of science. Uh, and so that's the, uh, that's the overall goal for a Vita Ed to allow that to happen uh, and to overcome those, those challenges. So just a little bit about uh, the background. It's meant to be something uh, that works in a lot of different teaching contexts. It was designed for undergraduate um, biology courses, but it's been adapted and easily adapted for graduate courses and even for high school uh, levels. You could use it as part of a lecture in a, in a big uh, lecture hall. Uh, it's runnable on anyone's computers, so you could do it uh, as homework assignment. Uh, you could do it in a lab, uh, open-ended. Our most recent versions, you can even run it on your tablet or even on your phone, uh, which makes it very flexible with regard to that. Uh, you can have uh, curriculum exercises that are uh, structured, guided, or you could have it very open-ended as an experimental environment uh, that's totally open-ended and allows students to design their own experiments. So it's meant to be very versatile with regard to that. It's based on a research platform. Uh, so the Avita uh, uh, platform itself is what we have used now for some 20 some years for just doing evolutionary modeling and experimental evolution. Uh, and the, uh, the structure of that is just embedded within this graphical user interface, but it's, it remains the same underneath. So even though it's, it's a friendlier uh, or usable system, uh, it still is uh, a model system that's very robust uh, and the very same uh, one that's used by researchers. Uh, so that means that it's uh, generating real data, uh, real patterns, and what you can do with it uh, can really model exactly the same practices that researchers themselves use when we're using uh, Avita for basic research. Um, these are just some uh, history of uh, the funding and the work that we've done. Version one uh, came out in the uh, in the period from 2004 to 2009 uh, with. Uh, uh, updates now with other uh, grant funding to uh, version three, and we're just now uh, finishing. Uh, we've had the, the beta version of version four up since last year, uh, and we're just about to release now the full final version. And I'll give you a link at the end so that you can you can get to this. Uh, and we've been grateful for funding from NSF and Howard Hughes Medical Institute and, and under our um, uh, center uh, work. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's been, um, it's received a number of awards. Uh, this one uh, from the International Society for Artificial Life. Um, 
And so it's been very well received uh, over the years. Uh, we've, we've put on workshops uh, regularly uh, to train faculty to do it. And as I mentioned, I had given a workshop in Argentina, the bottom left, the long uh, group there, that was the workshop at University of uh, Buenos Aires um, just uh, three years ago, or just before the pandemic, now four years ago. Uh, so this is something where we put on uh, training to let uh, instructors uh, decide how to incorporate it into their own learning goals uh, and, and what they're trying to teach in their class. So that's been very effective. We now have really instructors all around the world uh, who've done this. Now, when you teach about uh, evolution uh, in ordinary ways, you'll, you'll typically use natural organisms and you'll talk about the evolutionary concepts using things that are familiar, right? These are um, uh, examples from birds that you might use to explain how you get adaptive radiation, right? That's a good thing to do. A uh, very classic example of how you get adaptation, right? The peppered moth example from Kettlewell uh, with the industrial melanism as soot builds up, uh, it changes the, uh, the background on the trees. And so it's more adaptive uh, for moths to be camouflaged uh, if they're sooty, black colored compared to the other. Uh, a very nice natural example that I'm sure many of you have used. Um, all of these are good. Um, uh, you can use examples from across the biological world, adaptations uh, at the level of the uh, largest organisms, the whales, uh, but also down to small organisms like barnacles uh, and even down to bacteria. Every uh, type of organism uh, is subject to and evolves by uh, the mechanism of, of evolution by natural selection. And so it, it's something that, again, is explanatorily uh, universal uh, and important. Um, but the thing that's, uh, uh, I think, most uh, useful to recognize is that if you really understand how the law works, variation that's heritable, subject to natural selection, you recognize that it doesn't have to be instantiated even in DNA, uh, RNA, as we see it. Any system that can have those elements can be a substrate for it. Um, that's what Darwin's law uh, really is. Uh, understood very generally, it's applicable in this universal way. It's applicable to the humpback whales, uh, to the barnacles, to the bacteria, uh, and I'm going to uh, try to convince you, also applicable uh, equally in these artificial life model systems. Um, uh, all with the same explanatory power. Uh, having these elements will produce descent with modification. Uh, you should speak about it as Darwin's law. It is, it is universal in its application when these elements and these causal elements are at play. Now, what we do uh, in the digital system is to essentially have what you might think of as an analogy. And the research platform has um, a very abstract environment, but we can think of it as sort of a virtual Petri dish. Uh, on the one hand, you'd have uh, microorganisms and regular Petri dish, but in our uh, Avidian system, you're going to have artificial uh, organisms uh, in a virtual uh, environment. Uh, but the process that goes on in each of them uh, is the same. And that's what I wanted to show you now. What's happening at this uh, law-like level uh, is that code is evolving. Okay? The image on the left is a representation of the genome the genetic code of E. coli. Um, here's represented the circular genome. Uh, and you can see the uh, different elements listed with the different genes uh, along that um, uh, and what they, what they do. Uh, on the right, you have a representation of the genome of a digital organism, of a Navidian. Uh, and in this case, it's representing the computer instructions, 
The ones on the left are representing the molecular instructions right, of the genome. Here we have a genome that's digital, right? but the same thing is going on in each. The code okay, uh, produces some phenotype. Okay? Um, the code on the left would produce proteins, uh, uh, some other features that would be exemplified uh, phenotypically. The same thing is going to be true with the digital organisms. The genetic code will produce uh, phenotypic behaviors uh, that will make a difference in an environment. Uh, but in both cases, the underlying thing that's evolving is code. Uh, and the code uh, is something that's going to be able to vary. So here's what the code looks like for a Navidian. Okay? Uh, we have uh, a circular genome. Uh, and it's based upon uh, uh, a set of instructions uh, that uh, are from are labeled here from A to Z. So there are 26 possible instructions in the Avida basic uh, genome. Okay. And so what we do here is uh, if it's the third one, we'll just label it a C, right? It's the first one. So each of them have each of the basic instructions has a label. And so it's it gives us a way to visually say A through Z, here's what it, here's what it looks like. Uh, and uh, what happens then is that you can um, see uh, the execution of this genome, uh, which essentially is the, the running of instruction after instruction after instruction as it goes around. Uh, the little uh, arcs, the black arcs, that represents essentially the execution of those instructions. So you're so like you're following it along. Uh, it starts over in this representation. It starts at the three o'clock position at that W, and then works around clockwise. And what you're seeing here is the looping, which just indicates visually the instructions as they are executed. Uh, and sometimes uh, it does one after another. In other cases, depending upon the instruction, it can uh, jump over some. And in other cases, it can jump backwards. And what you're seeing in the upper right is a case where it has jumped backwards. The red line indicates a jump backwards. And then it's gone through again and it's jumped back again. And the arc increases in height uh, for each time that that happens. And so you can see a higher arc indicating that that has happened several times. Okay, So essentially, it's a looping mechanism that happens there. Uh, and that turns out to be where replication uh, uh, is controlled. Um, here's the uh, just an example of, of uh, a point where there's been a, a leap from one to another. Uh, and here, uh, that uh, reversal uh, with the red. Now, I mentioned in passing uh, our Beacon Center. So this was a science and technology center uh, that we had funded by the National Science Foundation. And what we did in this uh, over the course of really 10 plus years was do experimental evolution, to watch it in action and do experiments of it in action in both natural systems, but also in digital systems. And our logo here uh, was meant to capture how those are linked uh, with the, the helix uh, of DNA and then the helix of zeros and ones from the digital system, both combining uh, to essentially shine the light uh, of evolution. So this was meant to connect to that Dobzhansky quote of nothing in, nothing in biology making sense except in the light of evolution. That's something that we can il illuminate further given the linkage of, uh, of these systems. Um, this is just an example of some of the uh, places where uh, Avidian research um, has been published, uh, not just in computer science journals. These are in, in basic journals across the board, everything from science to nature, um, uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Science, um, various biology journals, and so on. So not specialized. This is very broad. These are all research uh, uh, publications. Uh, and if you take a look at the titles, you'll sort of see the range of topics, uh, everything from things having to do with adaptive radiation, 
I showed you that picture before of ad adaptive radiation in birds, but we can use Avita uh, to study adaptive radiation, the process of that uh, using these digital organisms. Uh, some of the work that I've done has been on modeling uh, the evolution of altruistic behavior of cooperation, uh, because you can set up the system so that it has the ability to donate resources. And then you can see whether that uh, ability will evolve um, uh, and how it will revolve, evolve in relationship to the theory uh, about, uh, about this. So you can do experimental tests uh, to, uh, uh, to test hypotheses about this. Uh, the whole range of, of topics, uh, one that we had here on the evolution uh, origin of complex features was uh, something we published uh, in Nature that allowed us to do an experiment that Darwin had loved, would have loved to have been able to do. He said, it'd be great if we could sort of show uh, the, all the steps in the process from something that does not have this feature to something that does have a complex feature. He says, but there's no way to do that in real life. Well, in a digital system, there is. Uh, and this was the first time in which we were able to show just what Darwin himself, of course, knew from indirect evidence, but how it is that small mutations can cumulatively produce very complex uh, functional features. Um, and um, this allows us to see how the mechanism does it. Um, so let's go through the elements again, just so you can see how it all works. We'll start with variation and how this is implemented in uh, the Avita system. Um, Darwin, when he was introducing the idea of variation, uh, started off with, uh, of course, in, in his own initial work uh, with the beaks of the finches that he saw on the Galapagos Island. But one of the main things that he did and really published before the origin was uh, years that he spent working on uh, barnacles. Uh, and he published this huge four volume work uh, showing all the different variations uh, uh, in barnacles, living barnacles, but also he did work on fossil barnacles and so on. And part of the result of this was to just demonstrate that even for so simple an organism as a barnacle, you could see slight variations, uh, at all levels uh, and historically through time and so on. So this is something where uh, it represents what you find in all biological organisms. And he was able to kind of demonstrate that this is, this is um, universal, right? There's always variation. Uh, there's always new variations that arise. Uh, and it's, it's from the simplest to the most complex or organisms. Uh, this is just a little search I did on on uh, Google Images for barnacle. Uh, and it was very nice, there's a little Darwin doll that appears in the middle of it sitting by some barnacles. Uh, but it just, if you expand, it just goes on and on, basically demonstrating with pictures now what Darwin had seen and shown uh, in his book, the vast uh, variety of slight variations, different sorts, different variations, and so on of barnacles. So, so that just establishes this basic first element. Uh, we see the same thing in uh, Avita. Uh, this is now kind of showing um, what I showed you before, the genome of uh, a single Avidian organism. But this is just to show you some of the varieties that you get. Um, the one on the upper left uh, is just a, a complicated one. Um, uh, but as you see other ones, uh, that evolve in relationship to it. Um, there are all sorts of differences. You can see the differences in the, the letters going around and we color code them just to, to highlight uh, the differences as well. As again, it's the A through Z, but the colors there help you visually see the differences. And you can also see the differences in the execution. Uh, in some of these cases, um, uh, you can see the the jumping happen in a different way than what I'd shown you before. In some cases, they go on, uh, and like the one on the bottom left, where it's gone on pretty much indefinitely uh, to the degree that it winds up not able to actually divide. It just goes on indefinitely and then dot, dies of old age, essentially. Uh, so you have organisms that are just not viable in this circumstance. But a whole range, and every time you run it, you'll be able to sort of see the differences because the varieties that are coming up, the variations that are coming up 
are doing so at random. Uh, so you get the same mechanism as producing variations uh, as in natural systems. Second element is replication. The variations that are going to be significant for evolution are those that can be replicated, copied, uh, inherited. Well, you know, in a natural system, you can see this in your Petri dish uh, with the replication of cells. Uh, and in that process, you can sort of see uh, how they'll expand and you get a, something that started as one becomes a, you know, a population in your dish. Um, you can see the same thing happening in Avita. Here now is, a, is an animation showing the replication of an individual Avidian. And you can sort of see that those arcs increasing in size, looping back and forth. That's essentially the copy process in action. And what you then saw was a genome being produced on the right side, which is the offspring of the uh, parent one on the right, on the left. Uh, and then there's a point at which it divides. Essentially, you now have an offspring. Uh, so that's the replication process. It has to copy itself. Uh, but the other thing that you notice is that it's not quite the same. There have been some random mutations that have happened. And you can see those there. If you just look along the, the left side, a C has turned to an M, another one has turned to an N, another one has turned to a Q. Uh, those are random changes from one instruction to a different one. Okay. Uh, we start off with the C as the dominant one. A C is actually a no operation instruction because uh, we want to start off with an ancestor that really does pretty much nothing but copy itself. Uh, and so that's why you on the one on the left, you see mostly Cs. And what happens on the right is that some of those have now turned mutated to a different instruction uh, at random from one of the 26. You can even have cases where it will mutate to itself, uh, a silent mutation of that sort. Uh, so again, it's meant to implement uh, this process of replication with new random variation uh, arising uh, in that process. So let's take a look at this, right? Here's now looking in a, at a slice of that. Um, it starts off with position one, as I mentioned, the three o'clock position. That's where the genome will start to execute. Uh, this is now the daughter cell, which is being produced, again, one instruction at a time, as the ancestor organism is copying itself one instruction at a time. Okay? And essentially, it's going to think of it as budding off uh, from the other cell. Uh, and then uh, cell division happens, and you have an offspring genome. Here, if you look at them, they're going to be exactly the same. This is one where we, for demonstration purposes, we turned off mutation. And so in this case, you've got a clone. Uh, and in the Avita ad system, which I'll show you, uh, you can have that as a switch. You just want to show pure replication. You can turn off mutation, or you can have it where uh, mutation is turned on in a natural way, and you can set the mutation rate, uh, and you can then see the, uh, the effects of that. Uh, we also have a setting where you can uh, force it to have mutations that are exactly the same each time. Uh, and that would just be a way of, of sort of an artificial way, uh, making sure that everyone is seeing the same thing, uh, even though it's not quite the natural process. <laughs> that genome is of an individual video but it is an organism within the population of this virtual Petri dish. And that's what you're seeing on the right. It's a square dish instead of a round one. Uh, and instead of those little uh, bacteria that you saw replicating, now you're going to see a population of avidians replicating. Uh, every square in the grid is uh, a location where one avidian uh, resides. And that's where it's um, executing its genome. So the one on the left that we're seeing is, is in that one position there. And others around it are other organisms uh, that have uh, themselves probably arisen from uh, some common ancestor. And the colors there represent, in this case, uh, their relative fitness to one another. So you can sort of see that there's been this um, change and there's some of them, like the yellow light ones, uh, are uh, of a higher fitness. This one doesn't show the, the, the key, 
Um, but you can you can actually select each of them and sort of see what their fitness is relative to the others. And here's what it looks like when it's evolving. So this is now uh, a petri dish. Uh, this is sort of a stop action to see it more quickly. Um, but you can sort of see it as it's expanding to fill the dish. And then these subpopulations that are evolving new features that give them an advantage, they wind up expanding faster than others and then taking over and then something else arises that itself is better that it takes over. What's essentially happening here is um, adaptation and outcompeting, uh, such that you see uh, over the course of generations, uh, new varieties uh, uh, evolving uh, and then taking over as they become uh, more competitive relative to others. So that's the sense in which you can see natural selection happening in action uh, in this virtual petri dish. So that's uh, now natural selection, uh, that last element. And I'm just going to give you some examples of this. Uh, on the upper left, you've got uh, starting with our original ancestor, and on the right, uh, a genome that's uh, evolved from that. On the bottom right, something that has uh, that started with that, but has now evolved, uh, and it's many generations later. And you can see the, all the differences that have accumulated. Uh, and uh, uh, in that second one, it now is able to perform functions um, in the virtual environment that give it an advantage uh, over, over the other. So let's just take a look at, at one of these things. Uh, so this is having to do with the cost of um, producing an, an an offspring. Um, you can see uh, the uh, one case um, uh, where uh, the bottom um, uh, bar shows you how many um, uh, instructions it took before it divided. Okay, so in the upper one, if you look at the bottom right of it, it says 430. That's to say it took 430 execution steps before it divided. Okay? Whereas the one that just popped out on the bottom, if you look at that, that's 189. Okay? So that's to say it only took 189 steps for it to divide. Okay? So the offspring cost is higher in the first one than in the second one. Okay? Uh, you, have to, you have to do more work uh, to, uh, to get that same result. That's to say a new, a new offspring. Now, that's the sense in which the lower one that we're just seeing the bottom peeking out of um, has uh, an advantage because it can produce offspring with fewer steps uh, than the top one. And that's one evolutionary feature that could give something an advantage. Uh, but the other thing that's going on is that uh, it's simultaneously um, evolving functions. Uh, and we think of them as metabolic functions, but essentially they're functions where the execution has to uh, produce uh, results, uh, uh, logical results essentially, in relationship to resources in the environment. Uh, and if it successfully does so, it's given extra energy, which lets it produce faster. So here's now a replication event. Okay? And this is what you'd seen before. Um, it's going through its cycle. This is now the copying cycle, producing the uh, the offspring, and there you have the offspring genome, and you can see the uh, the mutations that have happened. Um, and sometimes it produces things that are not viable, right? These are three organisms that were not able to actually divide. There was some mutation in there that was um, deleterious, uh, and in that case, uh, it will go through its cycle, but it will essentially die of old age without ever reproducing. So that's something that can happen in the process. Uh, um, we've now added uh, from, in our most recent version, ways that you uh, can manipulate some of these uh, factors. Uh, so on the left, uh, the one that people have been using up till now, if you add three, uh, you can check what resources are available in the environment. And that's the, in the red box there, you can sort of see is notos and nanos and andos and so on. It's not important really, uh, to know what those are, but I'll just sort of tell you briefly um, that those are thought of as um, metabolic resources. 
that if you evolve the functional ability to metabolize, will then give you an energetic reward, which will then let you run faster. Right? We think them, of them on analogy with sugars. That's why we give them the O's. Um, they're actually based upon logic operations, not and, or, that's the reason for the roots there. And basically what happens is that the instructions have to input numbers and then properly um, execute the logic. Um, uh, and if they do it successfully, uh, that's essentially functionally using that resource, which then gives them the energy boost, which then lets them run faster. Okay. Uh, the image on the right is our most recent version, uh, which gives us more flexibility for setting up experiments with regard to those resources. You still have the same resources available uh, from Nato's all the way up to Equos. And I'll just mention some of them are pretty easy um, to um, uh, to execute, and some of them are extraordinarily difficult. So Nato's uh, is on the easier side, the green ones, and as you as you go down in the colors, uh, those are more difficult, um, from easy to brutal, as you saw on the left. Uh, in the new version, we also have it so that you can uh, uh, change the amount of resources and whether it's uh, local or it's to the whole dish. Um, what we had before was that you essentially had unlimited resources, uh, had limited resources. Now you could have limited or unlimited resources uh, or none at all. You can you can uh, you can set that, and you can set amounts and so on, uh, whether it's depleted uh, and so on. So it gives you more flexibility for setting up different kinds of experiments. The other thing you're sort of seeing here is some of the controls. When you set up an experiment, you can have different dish sizes. Uh, you can change what the mutation rate is in that dish. Uh, a default of two, but if you want to see what happens at a lower rate or at a higher rate, you can run experiments with that. Uh, and you can put in different ancestors, uh, maybe just one, the ancestor here, or maybe two or three or more, and have them compete with each other so that you can set up controlled experiments. Um, there's also a function here uh, so that when replication happens, the replication happens uh, near the parent, which is to say in one of the uh, squares in the grid immediately surrounding it. If there's another organism that's already there, it will be overwritten. So that's a case in which replication, if you're faster, you might overwrite a competitor and then it's out of the picture. Uh, but we also have a well-mixed environment where you can change it to say we wanted to, to reproduce anywhere in the environment. So this is just ways of setting up different environmental settings for your experiments. So I mentioned the energy acquisition genes, uh, and that's what I'm sort of showing here on that grid line at the bottom. The bottom part represented how many steps it took. And this is the same image you saw before, but I'm just highlighting the difference. The bottom part, zero through 430, those are the number of steps. But along the top, where you see the three, four, zero, six, those are indications where this genome has successfully uh, executed one of those functions. So function three, four, zero, and so on. Uh, in this case, it's a highly advanced, uh, evolved uh, organism that can perform multiple functions. Right? This is actually one that can perform all of the functions. Uh, and you can watch and see uh, the point at which in its execution uh, that it's uh, able to do that, uh, which again, gives you the ability to look at this in a very fine-grained way and see how it is that evolution produced a new complex function. You can, you can observe it in action as it does that. So here's a summary now. Okay, what is it that we have in this system? We've got Avidians so that they replicate their own code, okay, which is to say they have inheritance. They make random errors as they do so, which is what's producing new variation. And they compete for space in that virtual Petri dish where differential reproduction uh, gives some an advantage over others and then provides essentially natural selection. So that's what you see here in, you know, now both of these images, the individual um, replication in the upper right, and then on the left, bottom left, a, an evolving dish, okay, where you can see the organisms in some cases getting better. Uh, and then the small graph there, uh, which was charting their fitness, you can see how fitness is increasing uh, over, uh, over time. Uh, so basically, uh, with all the elements put together, 
uh, Avita Ed gives you the ability to observe all the elements of the evolutionary process in action uh, so that you can test and, uh, and see it work uh, from uh, the simplest up to the most complex. Populations evolve over time. Uh, and this is the lesson that I hope uh, you sort of got from what I said at the beginning, that if you understand Darwin's process as a truly universal law, you recognize that what's going on in this case uh, is an instance of evolution. Right? It's not a simulation of it. Uh, the organisms are actually uh, randomly varying. They are actually reproducing, inheriting it. They're actually competing in natural sections. So these aren't simulations of those things. It's just that they're implemented in computer code rather than in uh, a molecular uh, substrate. But the substrate um, doesn't matter. Right? Daniel Dennett, a philosopher of uh, science as well, said evolution is substrate neutral. And that's sort of what we're seeing here. We're, we're implementing it in a different substrate, different code base, but the causal elements uh, are the same. So that produces now the last result, uh, descent with modification. That's essentially what you saw happening in the Avidian system. So Darwin's law is implemented, instantiated in the Avida and Avida Ed system. Now we can get back to the curriculum. Uh, what is it we want to teach? And this is now from the biology standards. Um, and these are standards that are just written for understanding conceptually what we want to try to get across with regard to evolution. Uh, so it's done in sort of a hierarchical way about the most important general things and then specific parts of it. So for evolution, it's important for students to understand that it involves change in the genetic makeup of a population over time, that that's what it is, uh, that they're linked by lines of descent. That was the descent with modification. Uh, the continuing process, that this is an ongoing thing, and then the Dobzhansky part about this being an explanatory framework. So these are the very broad uh, elements, but for each of them then, there's specific things you wanna know. So let's just look now at this one, which is the one that's um, mostly about the mechanism. Uh, if you now look at what they say needs to be learned with regard to that, here are some elements of that, that natural selection is one of those mechanisms uh, that produce that genetic change, uh, that it acts on phenotypic variations in the population, okay? uh, and that it's also driven by random process. And from what I've just shown you from uh, the Avedian system, uh, I think you can see it. You saw natural selection in happening. Those uh, 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 processes where it produced um, uh, the ability to metabolize those resources, those are phenotypic variations that were the result of their genotypic changes. Uh, and we also saw the random changes that produced those variations. So all of the elements here, you can observe happening uh, in um, the immunity system. Uh, and of course, it now gives you another way in which you can see how it's supported by evidence uh, in other systems as well. Um, Oh, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit on this first one, uh, natural selection. Um, so here's now a learning objective that's listed with regard to natural selection. You ought to be able to evaluate evidence produced by data that qualitatively and quantitatively investigate the role of natural selection in evolution. That's something that you, know, you wanna get across. And it's been very, very hard to do for evolution. But with Avita Ed, now you're able to do this in a very, um, systematic and precise way. Right? You can do quantitative data collection, qualitative, uh, and see how evolution uh, works in action. Uh, you can do modeling, uh, and it says real or simulated populations to predict what would happen. Now, I've argued that it's not a simulated population, it's actually a real population for evolution's purposes, uh, but you can use this in order to make predictions and then test them. And that's often what we recommend if you have time, you can use this to have students go through an entire sequence from the generation of a hypothesis uh, through the design of an experiment, the execution and analysis of it with data, and then the, the 
conclusions that you draw. So they're learning the process of science as they're doing experimental uh, evolution. So uh, that's uh, what's being shown here. Uh, we have exercises, but we also have uh, ways in which you can just run an entire full experiment. Um, and uh, in doing studies of this and, and the effectiveness and so on, uh, we find that students really do see the value of it. Uh, one saying it's the first time that I really felt like a scientist, having done an experiment from start to finish and then being able to present it to their peers. Um, this is just a set of some of the publications specifically related to Avita Ed uh, and um, uh, the testing and evaluation that we've done of that. Uh, and this is one set that sort of shows that in fact it's effective. Uh, you can see learning gains uh, from students that used it uh, relative to those that didn't. Uh, and here's uh, uh, just further uh, evidence from a paper uh, that's listed there if you want to look into details of that. So uh, here's some things we've gotten from faculty who've used it. Uh, I want students to be engaged in something that's their, that's their own, and Avita Ed gave them the ability to go in and interact with the process, the evolutionary process. We can play out complex relationships in a shorter period of time. Um, this is from someone from a research university. It says, we've run real-time evolution experiments with microbes. However, there's no other system that allows students to focus on the most important aspects of experimental science namely hypothesis generation, experimental design implementation, redesign analysis, then a V to add, okay? It lets you do the, the whole thing. Uh, and then another one uh, uh, where professor was emphasizing how you get to observe uh, the dynamics of, of evolution uh, and see it uh, uh, as a model system uh, where you can observe that in action. Uh, and then here's someone who was a high school teacher who did it. Um, he says, I, I think uh, that Avita uh, shows that people can understand uh, evolution. It's just that we haven't used these things like this uh, and given those, them those experiences. So this is why we think that it can actually be effective in helping overcome some of that public res resistance. So here to summarize uh, at the end, what are some of the advantages? Uh, it's an instantiation of Darwin's law. It actually implements it, doesn't just simulate it. Um, it's based upon a real uh, research platform. Uh, it's not just a, a, a toy version created for, um, for education. Uh, it lets students do real hands-on active experimental-based learning. Uh, and we have evidence from classrooms uh, to show, show that it works. Uh, it runs on your Mac, your PC, your tablet, your phone, and it's free. Uh, we have this available uh, so that you don't have to have to purchase it and so on. So we think this is something that uh, really helps solve some of those challenges that we have. And we now have uh, from our own server, server data uh, evidence that this is used in you know tens of thousands uh, of users around the world from 50 some different countries. Uh, so it's it's been very it's very successful. Uh, this is just some of my team uh, over the years, some of my co-PIs on the most recent grant, Rich Lansky, Louise Mead, Charles O'Free, and Jim Smith, and then some of the others, my developer, postdocs, uh, grad students, undergraduates from the current version four, and then some of the team members from earlier versions, starting from version one through version three and so on. And then here, uh, my last slide is a link uh, which uh, I encourage you to copy and uh, check out. This is the link to our general site. And from that, you can get curriculum, model exercises, a uh, link that will take you directly to the program so that you can use it, your students can use it, uh, all sorts of background material. Uh, the other thing that we're going to be putting up there, uh, we're in the process of creating uh, help videos. Uh, and we're gonna have a page that has sort of instructional videos that give overviews about different parts of the process and parts of the user interface. So essentially you can uh, have students use that or, or instructors can use it to learn how to use the program itself. Uh, we've also developed uh, instructional videos for instructors. Uh, we don't have those up yet and so on, but we're gonna have those available as well for people who want to learn as a teacher uh, how to do it. But this is gonna be the portal uh, that will let you get to that. And I hope that this has given you some reason to check it out.
So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Let me see if Fabricio wants to comment something. Uh... Hi, Professor Robert. Well, wonderful presentation. I, I, I am very curious to start using it. Actually, I, I just heard about Avida ED recently, but uh, in the past, I, I have seen a, a, another talk where people were using Avida ED. I just remember that because of the artificial life history. And I have a question is, I was trying it. You, you need to, to change the settings, to change the scenarios, but you do have some kind of tutorials like particular settings for a particular purpose. You have this to provide for teaching? Yeah, so we have a, a set of model exercises uh, that will can be used to uh, emphasize or to teach particular concepts. Um, so we have a lab book that sort of goes through them in sequence. And then we have just a bunch of other ones. Depending upon your own learning goal, you can use it for different purposes, but all of these are meant to be things so that uh, you can either take something that we've already tested or that someone else has developed and use those uh, or create some new ones. So we're always happy to have people come up with, with new examples. Now that we have version four, uh, with some new capabilities. Uh, we're actually very excited to see people de developing some new model exercises that will take advantage of these new features that we have in the system. Uh, but all of those uh, model exercises are available also for free uh, on the site and we have a, a lab book and so on. We're in the process of revising those now to fit with version four. So the ones that we have currently are the ones that go with version three, but probably within a few months, we'll have the ones up that revise those to be used with version four. Mm. I remember this first software for simulating evolution, Tierra. No, it is. Exactly, yes. This, this initial program they, where the people were very excited when they realized that the first initial simulation they could get at the end parasites and sex. That's and other right. Things going on. Can you have something similar to that in a video ID? Absolutely. Now, uh, well, not so actually not in Avita ED. Uh, so I'll just tell you, say the difference. Avita was inspired by Tierra. Uh, Tierra was sort of the first one that sort of showed that this was possible. Um, but it, it didn't work well as a research platform. It, it had been almost a proof of concept. And Avita was designed to be something that would take that same approach, but be structured in a way that it could be really used to do replicable and, and very precise experiments. Uh, so it's it's essentially sort of the, the next generation after Tierra and so on. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what the research version has continued to do uh, to make experiments possible. Avita Ed, Avita ED, um, uh, simplifies some of those abilities. The research version, you know, depending on the project, many things have been implemented and, and we didn't want to make it too complicated for people. So some of the, the mm -hmm. Uh, abilities have been constrained. And one of the things that we constrained was that we don't let you have um, uh, organisms jump from one another, uh, because that's how parasites, they could, they, could, they could make use of the genomes of another organism. And here we have them so that they're constrained. It just makes analysis too hard if you allow the, uh, the genes to be mixed and so on. So you don't have parasitism in this case, uh, just because of that simplification. But many, many other sorts of things that they discovered there, uh, you also see here and, and more. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Robert, I, I got from GitHub the Avida and installed in our server. I, I, put, uh, I put this in the comments here in the chat. Uh, is there a problem to, to install? Is, is that freely distributed? Uh, if it's if it's something that's done from our, from the site, it's 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 really usable. Um, as I said, for uh, I think what you've put there is maybe something that's linking to the uh, to the research version, um, and that's a that's sort of a separate thing. Uh, and uh, <laughs> can I distribute it because it it is in our server? It's not advertised. You have to put the slash avida to to 
open it, but uh, it's open and it's working. I, I think that Fabricio tried it. Yeah, so so it's, we have this as open source. Uh, so it is open source that we allow, allow people to, to use. Uh, but it should be something where you you know credit is given. Obviously, it's just the general. Um, mm -hmm. So the real software is like a Java application that you download and you open. So for the research version, uh, it's it's in uh, an application form. For Avita mm -hmm. Ed, we initially had it as an application form. Uh, and then in a later version, version three, we made it into a web version. So you don't have to download an application. It will mm -hmm. run in your browser. Uh, and so mm -hmm. the link that I gave you will take you to the main page. And then there's uh -huh. a launch page there. Uh, and from that, you can go uh, directly to the... Uh, uh, and I, I, will, to... I will give you, let me give you the, the direct link now. Uh, so yeah, in the, in the chat, please. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll like you to try the one that we installed here, just to, to check if, it, if it's another one. So that one, the first one I did there is what takes you to the uh -huh. page. And then the second one here uh, is what takes you to the application itself. So uh -huh. that's, that's the one that takes you to version three. Uh, uh -huh. And then as I said, uh, version four, I'll put that one in as well. Uh, okay. Just a moment. Uh, here is, that one is the current beta version of application of version four. Mm -hmm. And very soon we'll have the final version up there. So those are the ones that uh -huh. I've been Talking about. Uh, okay. So, what is the one that we started here? This one, BioInf, BioInfo, ECB, UFMG. That's that's part of the research uh, version. The research yeah. version. Ah, it's quite similar, the output. But, uh, okay. So, uh, we <laughs> we uh, everyone has the, the the real links now to, to start playing. Yeah. And I also would like to ask many people wants to ask questions here. I think that Sean Paulo also. Uh, but uh, uh, a vida sounds very Portuguese for the life in in Spanish or French. Uh, the article would not be a vida. So uh, what's the reason for the name? It's from uh, 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 artificial. It's it's from artificial. Artificial. Artificial life. life. So the uh, researchers in this will talk about a life. Uh, and so that's when, when the original uh, development was done, we thought, what should we call it? And the idea was, oh, well, let's let's uh, let's just recreate that. Uh, so it's ah uh, for our uh, is the ah. Uh, so you, you know now that for us in Brazil, we, we take it like day life, a vida. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was originally from the from the Spanish. That from was artificial, okay. Artificial vida. John Paulo would like to ask a question. You were with the camera. Yeah, Doctor Pennock, congratulations for the wonderful job. Yeah, I'm really over overwhelmed about the the potential that of the the tool that we can use and I can use on my grad and undergrad classes of molecular evolution. So thank you very much for your presentation. I wonder if other kinds of phenomena or other kinds of micro, micro and macro evolution, evolutionary events can be modeled using Avida, like founder effect or butter that effects, and yes. even only the only drift, only the the actuation of genetic drift. Yes, all of those things can be observed because, as I said, right, this implements the process, and so all of the things that can happen in natural systems can happen here as well. And we actually have some exercises uh, to demonstrate some of those. So there's one exercise that's specifically on genetic drift. Uh, so if you're interested in having that for your students, you know, after they've kind of learned to do it, they can do this exercise and it sort of shows, you know, how drift uh, works as a process as well. Um, so uh, 
that's actually one of the big advantages, I think, that any of the evolutionary concepts that you might want to get across, uh, you're able to, to do here. The one thing that we don't have at the moment uh, is that we do not have sex built in. <laughs> uh, Avidians are asexual. Uh, and so all of our exercises, and as you sort of saw, you know, it's, an, it's a single organism which, you know, randomly mutates and off, but it's an asexual reproduction. Mm -hmm. Now, in the research version, there have been uh, some graduate students who have used it to study the evolution of sexual reproduction. And so there's actually a, a version of the research uh, version that lets you have sexual reproduction, uh, but that's sort of a specialized one. And if we're able to do version five at some point, that's our next step to put in to put in uh, sexual reproduction. But at the moment, it's limited to asexual. So, 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 meth methods like conflict and cooperation, and how can how can I say conflict, cooperate, cooperation, and all the things that we can see also in evolution, they are not. They they can be bodily we use in Avida and I I wonder if extended phenotypes types of research can also be modeled using Avida. So again, with the research version, uh, we have um, code that lets you do like I was mentioning the one that I work that I did with um, uh, evolution of altruism cooperation that requires. Um, that you have code that lets, like what I showed you now is that you're gaining energetic resources by having uh, evolved the ability to metabolize something. Um, but in the Vita ad, it's, it's your own energy, but you can't donate it and so on. In the research version, what we did was provide extra ability so that code could be, um, or that energy could be donated. Okay? Uh, that's what led us be able to see how that could be evolved, uh, uh, cooperation and, and altruism. And indeed, that's what we found. You, it, it fit perfectly with the expectations of theory uh, that they did evolve to be uh, altruistic uh, more often to those that are more closely related to them. And we did a really interesting ones where you could have um, different ways of measuring uh, uh, degree of relatedness. Uh, so we could we could actually test a more generalized view of how um, uh, that form of altruism evolves. So that worked very well, but that's not included in the educational version uh, because it would just require some, some extra complexity. We want this to be something that doesn't overwhelm <laughs> overwhelm the students. Uh, so you can't do that particular type of experiment here, um, just because we don't we don't allow it to 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 exchange that information. The same thing with regard to the earlier question that Fabrizio asked about parasites. Um, we intentionally limit so you don't have exchange of genetic information. Uh, again, because it just becomes too complex to analyze in that case for students. Uh, but in the research version, if you get excited about that, then you can then you could try it there. Thank you very much. And yeah. I'm really, I'm, I, I'm really ruminating on your one, in one or two your first figures about the the perception of the of the the people perspe perceptions of evolution, and it got me very worried because here in Brazil, kind of like the U.S., we have we kind of have a, a ritual stress on the evolutionary events and on, on the evolutionary perspective and and we and we like tools to to bring these we like tools to bring the the evolutionary thinking more easily for the the massive crowns i'm i'm not talking about only grad students that are are more are more open minded to things like that but i'm talking about the the population in general the the, the people in general because I'm very worried about the this this lack of confidence mm -hmm. on evolution and this lack of understanding on evolution, even evolutionary events that can also jeopardize the entire that the entire fate of a country on a pandemic scenario like COVID-19, like we have here. So yeah. thank you very much. 
And I, I will study the, the, the publications and the both versions of Avida for that. And one last question is, where can we improve? We like we scientists, we uh, instructors or evolution evolution instructors. Where can we improve? Not only by applying a video that, that it will be great, but about other things, other uh, uh, on the on our communication skills. So, so some of the work that I've done has been thinking about what's important for the public uh, understanding of science. Uh, and I think that's what you're referring to when you when you have a cultural uh, situation where there's resistance. It's partly our responsibility to do better at explaining things. And, and part of the reason that I developed this was to have a tool that makes it possible to show evolution in action. Right? It's, it's there's nothing more convincing than to be able to see it for yourself rather than to just have someone tell you about it. Um, but it's also true, as you say, that we can be better at how we communicate. And there, I think the thing to do uh, is just to emphasize uh, what I was trying to do here, that evolution should be thought of as a law of nature, right? And we should, we should be calling it Darwin's law uh, and that we should be emphasizing its utility. Uh, so you mentioned its importance for understanding like a, a pandemic. That's exactly the case, right? If you don't understand how evolution works, how can you possibly understand infectious disease and how you know the varieties... Uh, of, of an infection can evolve over time, and in fact have. Uh, with COVID, uh, there was a group that was tracking the evolution of the virus uh, in real time, essentially. And you can see the tree as it's, uh, as it's diverging. Part of the reason that you have to have new vaccines is because it has evolved, right? Uh, we can't have a good public response if we don't recognize that evolution happens. So I think you're exactly right. This is something where uh, we have to do better at explaining that it is evolution that is in action here and we ought to understand it in order to be able to better respond and really in this case, protect public health. Thank you very much and congratulations mm -hmm. again. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You, you always uh, refer to Darwin's law. Uh, in Brazil, we have a problem that you mostly we refer to uh, theory, Darwin's theory. And uh, some people say, wow, well, it's just a theory. <laughs> so uh, is, is this re really popular? I did not realize when I was in the United States, Darwin's law, or people say Darwin's theory also in, in these states. It's, it's most common to talk about evolutionary theory. Uh, theory, I, evolution and theory. Evolution theory. That's just an ordinary way that scientists would talk about it. Uh -huh. Talk about gravitational theory or cell theory. Uh -huh. No, but, sure. In the sci in, in scientific in world, this is okay, but uh, outside is a problem here. It becomes a problem. And so I've this is some of the work that I've been doing that I think for communication, which is the uh -huh. question was about, that we would do better to start talking about it using that term, Darwin's law, as opposed law. to something else in order to uh -huh. emphasize uh, its universality and generality uh -huh. and from the point of view of an ordinary person. If they hear that, um, I, then I, I, it's just a theory. Right? It's not just I, a theory. I, go, I go a kind of more softy. I, I refer to the history of evolution. Oh, the history of evolution tell us that it is the history because there is, there is a history of evolution. It, it's uh, absurd. It, it's a... Uh, Register, right? Is the is a history, and uh, if you think the history of, of evolution is also in in the Genesis in Bible, there is a history of evolution. Uh, things that uh, did not uh, exist and start existing, and then another thing starts existing. So, a, a history of uh, the evolution and the, the appearance of the variants and etc. I don't, I don't, I think I, I avoided the, the theory <laughs> words. So that, that term, this gets to the philosophy of science that I'm interested in, right? Uh, sure. About what, what theory is in a philosophical sense is very important. And scientists in their training learn how to understand that, right? A theory in a scientific sense is an explanatory framework. Uh -huh. It doesn't work well with 
uh, ordinary uh, language and description. So the other thing that I would recommend is that we talk about just instead of evolutionary theory, we talk about evolutionary science. What does evolutionary science say? Uh -huh. And that just avoids the whole term of theory uh, and just gets it in. Uh -huh. the yeah, it's good for outside, for the people outside. Yeah. Sure. We have a question from Carlos William that was in the YouTube. He, he posted there. He said it's an interesting tool and uh, wonders if it's possible to translate the application. For translating the application, we have to go into the Java code, right? Uh, to make it so the interface has a different language and so on. This mm -hmm. is something that we're working on. Uh, all of our, our uh, instructor videos uh, and materials. I actually have someone who's working just initially to do translations into Spanish. So we'd have at least that as a as a first thing. If someone mm -hmm. would want to do it into other languages, that would be that would be great. Yeah, um, we don't yet have the ability within the code to do uh, the translation, uh, but we've talked about that, uh, and you know maybe we'll be able to do that in version five. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. And also he comments that, uh, are you there? Car oh, Carlos is in the YouTube because he commented that uh, in Brazil there is uh, an artificial intelligence tool for teaching evolutionary, evolutionary biology called For Alexa. Yeah, but uh, Carlos is in the YouTube. So uh, Carlos, if you would like to ask, uh, to tell us something about For Alexa, in eight seconds, you're going to listen to me in the YouTube and you can post there that I can bring here. Fabricio. Yeah, well, this tool was published by some colleagues from the northern part of Brazil. They were doing this kind of analysis during pandemics and they created this tool to use in Alexa. It's a question and answer tool for teachers in evolutionary biology. Very interesting. So I, I put here in the chat a link for the paper, the PubMed link. So you can, um, how is it? Very interesting. Yeah. Alexa, evolve the species. <laughs> <laughs> like that. No? So Dr. Robert, if you don't have uh, sexual reproduction, uh, you probably don't have uh, Kimura, uh, 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 how do, you, do I say the uh, natural selection? Uh, help me, Fabrizio. Kimura neutral selection. What about neutral? Neutral. You neutral. Yeah. What do you mean? Neutral tests, neutrality tests. Kimura, Tajima, things like that. So, so again, this is something where in the research version we have done things with with uh, with sex. So it is certainly possible and you can observe all of those things. Here, we're just so far limited with uh, 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 asexual reproduction, but all of the, uh, the effects of that are, are all visible here. Okay. Sure. So what's the next step? You are working in the scientific one. And the educational one is kind of uh, ready and you have uh, uh, some workshops. You actually, you teach the trainees, you teach the professors, right? That's, that's what we have done uh, really up until the pandemic. Uh, and at that point we had, to, we had to stop. And so what we've uh, done now is to do uh, these videos uh, and those are the, uh, what we're going to be posting. Uh, so that people could essentially take the workshop, but in this virtual uh, video form. Ah, in the video form. Yeah. So should we organize one in the virtual form with uh, students from all the country here? Uh, so that would be that would be great if you guys great how, how long it. how long does it take? It's like if it were it was a discipline or so. How long does it take this video uh, workshop? So when we do it in person, we do it over a, a two and a half day period. So it's uh -huh. sort of full time for those. Uh, obviously with videos now, you can do it at your own pace. Uh, so 
Ah, okay. You don't have to talk to the students uh, like in a webinar or so. No, no, we, we recorded them. Uh, so they that they were all that way. So um, yeah, that's the that was the response to the pandemic. We thought, how can we keep these things going? Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. we have not yet put these out into a form that's that's publicly accessible. Partly, it's uh, it's still to come, uh, but they're ready to go, and and those will slowly be coming out uh, uh, with mm -hmm. help videos and other things. So. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's that short, we could uh, put together with um, a meeting in Brazil from the Genetic Society or so, like, you know, those courses that we have before the Congress. It, it could be nice to, be to bring or, those or, guys or, together. Or if you want to, to fly me down, I would love to come to Brazil again. <laughs> ah, sure. So that, that would be even better. Sure. <laughs> Let, let's plan that because we can get many professors uh, it together. Won't be, it won't be by lack of invitation, okay, Robert? Be sure. <laughs> <laughs> that will be the invitation from them. Um, I, I suggest you to go to Jean Paulo's place because I want to, to go back to there <laughs> also. <laughs> It's a nice place by the Northeast of Brazil. Yeah. But also, we have good food here in, in uh, Minas Gerais, right, Fabrício? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I thank you all very much for your questions. Yeah, time to thank you for coming and, and showing all, uh, to us all the Avida details. And uh, I'm sure that people will take the link and play a little bit. And then uh, we will we plan on this uh, invitation for a, a visit, right? That would be wonderful. wonderful. All right, well, very good. Thank you all so very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. That. Thanks a lot. Right. Goodbye, yeah. everyone. Bye-bye, people. You much. See you there.